Christianity versus the world uh, religions. This is lesson uh, number uh, three. Hang on a second, here we go. Um, and tonight we're going to do Christianity versus, we've got two tag team, I guess, uh, Zoroastrianism and Islam. So we're going to talk about two other uh, religions, uh, world religions, uh, in the group of uh, uh, actually 11 world religions. We said that uh, there are three main groups, just, just a bit of review, uh, three main groups of religions. Uh, they're grouped uh, geographically. The Near Eastern religions, which include Zoroastrianism, what we're going to look at tonight, Judaism, which we uh, looked at uh, previously, Christianity and Islam, which we're going to look at tonight. Then uh, there are the Eastern religions, Hinduism, Sikhism, uh, Jainism, and then the Far Eastern religions, Confucianism, Buddhism, Shinto, and Taoism. Uh, we also said there was another group uh, called the primitive religions, but they're not really organized world religions. So uh, we, look, we took a look at those a couple of weeks back as well. Uh, so far, as I say, we've uh, studied uh, primitive religions, Christianity as our central religion against which we compare the others, and uh, Judaism, which we looked at last week. So today we're going to look at Zoroastrianism, begin with Islam and then end up with um, Islam to round out our look at the Eastern uh, or nor uh, uh, Near Eastern group. So let's do Zoroastrianism and go through our uh, different headings. So Zoroastrianism, the founder, uh, Zoroaster lived 660 to 583 uh, BC. You'll find that a lot of these religions were started uh, in, in around the same time period. Uh, he was a camel herder from the lower social and cultural class in Persia, today Iran. Uh, he claimed that he had received special visions while attending religious festivals of a primitive religion of that time. He claims to have received seven visions over a 12 year period. The visions were revelations about what God wanted him to preach. And uh, when he began telling people about his visions, uh, he had no converts for 10 years. Uh, some of the origins of this religion, according to tradition, the first convert was the Persian king Vishtaspa. So you don't have anything going for you for 10 years and then your very first convert is a king. So he was, he was doing pretty good. This explains how this religious uh, movement quickly spread since after his conversion, the king made this religion the official religion of the kingdom. The religion, however, had a benefit effect or a beneficial effect on society because it espoused ideas of social justice and marriage codes. It flourished from the death of Zoroaster until the conquest of Alexander in 331 BC, who began mixing Greek ideas with the ideas of this particular religion. It uh, declined for a century as the Greeks conquered the Persians, but it revived again in the second century, all the way till the sixth century AD, when the Muslims vanquished the Persian empire and along with vanquishing the empire, it also destroyed this religion. And so many of the people that followed uh, Zoro, uh, Zoroastrianism uh, migrated to India, where there was a, a, a toleration of many different kinds of religions. And 70% of those who practice this religion are now living in India, mostly in the, what's called Bombay area. There are only about 125,000 people left that actually follow uh, this uh, religion in an organized way. Their concept of deity, Zoroastrianism began as a, an ethical monotheism. In other words, they believed in one God and they believed that you ought to be doing right. You know, do what's right. Uh, Ahura Mazda, who is the supremely good and powerful creator and sustainer and, uh, and savior. Uh, Angra Mainyu, who was the evil spirit who was in a struggle with the God of good. 
and who would eventually be thrown down in a final struggle. Uh, they also believed in angels. Uh, angels were considered as the personification of the attributes of Ahura uh, Mazda. Their concept of mankind, uh, Mazda created man uh, through the agency of his Holy Spirit. Man's special vocation was to keep his soul. You know, if someone said, what's your job? What's your main idea uh, in life? And a Zoroastrian would say, to keep my soul, to keep my soul right. As I'm going through this, you're going to be hearing things, well, that sounds familiar, man, that's just like Christianity or that's just like the Judaism. Well, of course, this religion borrowed a lot of ideas from, from, from other religions and you'll see these ideas kind of you know, rise to the surface as you begin to study them. Their concept of salvation. Zoroaster taught that the constant selection of right over wrong would ultimately lead to salvation. Performing good works established righteousness. Um, he said that life is a struggle between good and, and evil and those who choose good, they go to heaven. Uh, the, eternal, uh, the eternal resting place uh, was presided over uh, by the angel Gabriel. So wonder where they got that idea, you know. Their cultus, their worship practices. Uh, well, the purification of fire was their main activity. So if you went to a Zoroastrian uh, worship, there would be fire of some kind, okay. Uh, because fire was the representation of Ahura Mazda. All right. uh, they had no priests, no clergy as such. Uh, lay leaders were the ones who conducted the worship. Uh, the bodies of the dead were left in what were called towers of silence to be eaten by birds so their flesh would not contaminate the earth. So they build these high towers, uh, you know, and the bodies would just stay up there until they were pretty much picked uh, clean. Uh, they had a, um, a body of literature, their scriptures, the Avesta, which is knowledge. Some of it was written by Zoroaster himself. The Gathas, or the Psalms. Uh, the Vendidad uh, was the history and the theology of uh, this religion and the Yasna, uh, the worship guide, if you wish, or the sacrifice guide. I want to read you a little section from the Yasna, for example, just to give you an idea of what their holy writings were like. So this is Yasna 10 verse 16. It says, to five do I belong, to five others do I not. Of the good thought am I, of the evil am I not. Of the good word am I, of the evil am I not. Of the good deed am I, and of the evil not. To obedience am I given, and to deaf disobedience not. To the saint do I belong, and to the wicked not. And so from this on to the ending shall be the spirit's parting. So just in that little passage there from one of their holy books, you get an idea of their theology. Do what's right, do what's good, because if you do what's right, and if you do what's good, this is you know, what will uh, send you to heaven. Uh, as far as geography is concerned, as I said, it began in Persia, which is in modern day Iran, uh, spread to uh, Afghanistan and uh, to India, where the majority of the individuals who follow this religion presently live. A couple of, um, you know, miscellaneous uh, ideas from this uh, religion. Uh, one significant one is that they believe that a special envoy was sent by God every thousand years in order to give new teachings. And this person was called the Sayoshyant. Now, the Zoroastrians believed that Jesus was such an envoy. They thought he was a Zoroastrian envoy. Uh, some think that the wise men, you know, in the Bible, the wise men that came, that came to see Jesus, there are many scholars who think that they were followers of Zoroaster. 
Their monotheism became dualism eventually as they raised the profile of the evil spirit to the point of being an enemy of their God and a rival of their God. So at the very beginning of their religion, there was an evil spirit who caused a lot of trouble, but uh, their God was uh, supreme. With time, this evil spirit grew in power and status, and eventually it became you know, a dual religion where each spirit was, was vying for control and uh, for, um, um, for uh, victory. Um, the bridge of separation, an interesting concept. Uh, their idea of you know, after you die, what happens? Well, the bridge of separation, it was a bridge between heaven and hell. And at judgment, a person would cross over uh, and if they had done good deeds, uh, a hand would point towards paradise and Zoroaster would accompany the individual across safely to the other side. If an individual was guilty of sins, uh, they could only go halfway on the bridge of separation and then they would stumble and fall to their punishment in, uh, in hell. As I say, uh, it is considered a world religion because of when it started and its influence when it did begin. Today, it has very little influence. And as I say, there's only a very small amount of people that follow this uh, religion. And um, uh, yeah, so there's uh, Zoroastrianism, just a small comparison uh, that we have to Christianity. And again, I, I want to remind you that a lot of these religions, especially the, uh, the, uh, the Far Eastern religions, uh, they resemble Christianity. They pick and choose a lot of stuff that comes from Christianity and uh, Judaism as well. All right, so let's look at the other religion I said we'd examine tonight. Probably a little more familiar with this one, Islam. Uh, it's the second largest religion in the world today. Christianity is the first. The third is Buddhism. Uh, the technical name of the religion is Islam, which means uh, submission, a concept that plays a large part uh, in the religious thought of, uh, of, um, of Muslims and uh, this religion. It's also called uh, Mohammedism after its founder, Muhammad. Uh, not so much today, but I remember when I was younger, uh, I used to hear this term. Uh, the term uh, Muslim uh, comes from the word Islam and it means uh, a true believer. So you have Islam, that's the religion. Uh, Muslim, that's the believer in Islam. You have Muslim or Mohammedan, that's the founder of the religion and it's an alternate name used for this religion, as I say, not so much, not used by Muslims themselves. It's as if, you know, if, uh, it's as if we uh, in the churches of Christ refer to ourselves as Campbellites, you know. Yes, uh, you know, Alexander Campbell and that group of uh, individuals had significant influence in the restoration movement, but we're not, we're not Campbellites, you know. Well, uh, Muslims would uh, object uh, to the same idea uh, if we call them Mohammedans. You know, they're not Mohammedans, you know, they're, they're Muslims, all right? Uh, the founder, speaking of Muhammad, uh, lived 570 to 632 uh, AD. Uh, he lived in Mecca. He worked uh, as a merchant. Uh, he was married with one daughter whom he named Fatima and his wife was Jewish. Uh, very interesting. Uh, you wonder where a lot of the ideas come. His wife was Jewish. Uh, Kandiga is her name. His uncle was caretaker of the local temple and uh, Muhammad uh, was displeased at the sexual depiction used in the worship uh, and the activities of the pagan religion around him and uh, he believed that this did not represent sincere religion. And in that he was, he was correct. Uh, he claimed to have, this is another individual, he claimed to have seven visions from the angel Gabriel. And from there he wrote the substance of the Quran, which is the holy book of Islam. 
And of course, as you notice, you know, we looked at Zoroaster, he had visions, you know, all by himself he had visions, you know, and he based his religion on the visions that he had. And now along comes Muhammad, what does he have? Well, he has visions too. Uh, he has seven visions. Who was there when he had visions? No one, he was there uh, by himself. And it's interesting that the angel Gabriel plays a part in both Zoroastrianism as well as uh, Islam. Anyways, on to origins. Uh, they consider 622 AD, year one of the Muslim calendar. Uh, they consider 622 as the beginning of Islam. It's when Muhammad had uh, began to preach concerning his visions and his, uh, his writings. Uh, he was persecuted. He fled to Medina, uh, another city, uh, but he converted 10,000 people in the following decade. 10,000 people in 10 years, that's a pretty good, pretty good record. In 630 AD, he took an army to invade Mecca and he conquered it and he destroyed the old temple, which was what started all of this. You know, he just was uh, uh, not insulted, but he was disgraced this, of some of the pagan practices taking place in that temple. And so he brought an army back and they destroyed that temple and they built the Kaaba, which is a square building that is there now which holds what they call the black stone. And you know, people go around it and they try to kiss that stone, go around. And the stone, of course, is really a, a meteorite. It's a piece of a, a meteorite that, that fell in that area that they uh, discovered. But to the Muslim, this is an, a sacred object even uh, to this day. In 632, Muhammad died and his leadership was replaced throughout the centuries by different people. One of his great contributions, however, was that he was able to unite the nomads and the dispersed Arab tribes into one nation by giving them a common religion. A great feat, historical, socially, uh, that he is accredited with. They were disparate tribes and nomadic tribes wandering everywhere, everybody had a different religion, but he managed to unite them under the banner of Islam. Uh, like Judaism, uh, Muslims also have different periods in their history. They have the period of the Caliphs, uh, 632 to 661. The Caliphs were uh, deputies charged to lead Islam after the death of Muhammad. So you had a short period of time uh, of the Caliphs. Then the uh, Umayyads, uh, 661 to 750, these are a family of rulers that were based in Damascus. They led the Muslim effort to expand the religion and the empire all the way to Spain and to France. But they were defeated by Charles Martel in the Battle of Tours in 732. And that battle significant historically uh, because had the French not won that battle, uh, uh, the, the Muslims would have taken all of, all of uh, Europe. Uh, so strong was their uh, movement. Then you had the uh, Abbasids. The Abbasids, 750 to 1258 AD. Uh, they overthrew the Umayyads and uh, they established Baghdad as their headquarters. And uh, they pushed Islam into Asia and Eastern Europe and went all the way to Italy. Uh, after that, you had uh, Mongolian dominance from 1258 to 1299, a rather short period. Uh, that's because uh, the Mongolians invaded Muslim lands and people. Uh, in 1271, uh, the uh, Mongolian Marco Polo uh, visited China under uh, Mongolian rule. After this, you have the Ottoman Empire, 1299, all the way to 1924, the long, longest period, longest uninterrupted period of a particular uh, rule in the Islamic world, 700 years. Uh, they defeated the Mongols and they expanded the religion uh, to its present regions uh, today. And then you have uh, modern Islam, that's from 1900 to the present time. 
The Ottoman Empire, which was a magnificent empire, very rich, uh, very ornate, very powerful, lasted 700 years, uh, fell in the 1900s, uh, and uh, there was no leader, no single leader that rose up to, you know, to take the place. And so one of the goals has been to try to unite Muslims into one nation, but it has not been successful. There are many sects and each has its own leaders and theologies. Each has its own claim to you know, be in a, the succession of you know, uh, Muhammad. So you have, for example, the Sunnis, what we call the Sunnis. Uh, they make up almost 90% of, uh, of uh, Islam, uh, of uh, Muslims. Um, they're very conservative uh, in their religion. Uh, you have the Shiites, uh, only 9%, uh, yet a very powerful 9% of that population, of the Islamic population. Uh, for example, uh, Iraq and Pakistan, they believe uh, each era produces a leader related to Muhammad. Uh, but they never agree who that particular leader is. And so you have wars that break out. Uh, for example, the war between Iraq and Iran was based on who was the legitimate leader. You know, you hear about, remember Khomeini, who was uh, in Iran? Well, you know, one group thought he was the legitimate the successor from Muhammad, uh, but others said, no, he's not the legitimate uh, 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 leader uh, from Muhammad. And they went to war over this and millions of people were killed in, in that war. Then you have smaller group, the Sufis. They're the mystics. Uh, they would be the Pentecostals, uh, you know, the uh, Pentecostal um, uh, Muslims, if you wish. Uh, the Baha'i groups. Uh, the Baha'i groups, they, they claim to have the final truth. And uh, believe it or not, they separate themselves from uh, mainstream Islam. And then you have a group like the Black Muslim and the Islam Nation, what I call social Islam, uh, mostly interested in politics rather than uh, religion. Uh, the concept of uh, deity uh, among uh, uh, Muslims, of course, Allah is God. They believe that God is one and totally in control. Uh, the great difference between Christian concept of God and the Muslim concept of God is that Christianity's God is consistent in his promises, whereas Allah is not necessarily so. The idea is that God is in charge and he will do whatever he pleases and whatever he does, well then that's okay. Praise Allah. Along with this idea of God is the idea of kismet or fatalism, you know, whatever is, is. Nothing you can do to, to change it. And because of this idea of kismet and because God will just do whatever he wants, you know, sometimes you do everything you're supposed to do right and you don't make it into paradise anyways, you know, because God decides, yeah, nah, not today, <laughs> not you. <laughs> Um, you know, I smile at this, but, but I certainly wouldn't want to live my religious life with, with a hope that hinges on how God feels today, you know. Uh, also the idea of fatalism, what is, whatever it is, is. Uh, because of this, the culture is static. Things don't change because that's the way Allah wants it. No change. Poverty, fine. We have poverty. I guess that's what Allah wants. So we're not going to change it. Uh, and I don't want to get into political commentary, but just think for a moment, all the countries that have gone into uh, uh, Muslim countries in order to change them and ask yourself how much success they've had in changing them. All right. And uh, you'll, you'll understand uh, why they have this idea here. Their concept of man, mankind, man is created by Allah. The difference between the sexes is very important in Islam. Man is created superior to woman, period. 
This is why the religion reinforces the customs in Muslim countries, you know, a lot of Muslim countries, women can't drive, they can't get an advanced education, they have to be covered, so on and so forth. Uh, they're not equal to men. Men, however, must submit to Allah in whatever situation he finds himself, he finds himself in. And so you wonder, you know, why, why is there no progress? What's the big deal? You know, in Saudi Arabia, for example, one of the young kings there, <clears throat> and, you know, they changed the law to give women the right to drive a car. You know, I mean, we've got cars that almost drive themselves, you know what I'm saying? But now finally, this year, a law passed, uh, uh, you know, to allow women to uh, drive cars, you know, and it's taken a hundred, over a hundred years to get to this point. Why? Well, because women are not equal to men, that's why. A little, a little footnote there, one of the women who kind of you know, led the charge to get this, uh, this, uh, this right for women, you know, she's now in prison and locked up for uh, you know, subverting the government. So you, uh, things don't change and, 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 God, and God doesn't want things to change, right? Uh, as I say, their uh, idea of uh, salvation, uh, salvation comes when man is totally submitted to God and this submission is expressed in completing what is called the five pillars of faith. The first, uh, the five pillars very quickly, the first one, confession. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. The continual repetition of this this confession here is akin to baptism in Christianity. You want to become a Christian, one of the first steps you take is that you're immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, this is what Christianity teaches, the Bible teaches. Oh, you want to become a Muslim? Well, then what you have to do is you have to say, uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's like the first step in, in the conversion uh, in the conversion process, except we don't, we're not baptized every single day over and over again. It's a once in a lifetime situation. In Islam, this confession here continues to be said over and over and over again. The second part is almsgiving. Uh, you must never go by a beggar without giving. Uh, the, 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 uh, the official giving is a two and one half percent. It's called the zakat, uh, and it's usually collected by the government. Uh, beggars in many uh, Muslim countries are licensed, it's part of the society. Um, a third part of your five pillars of faith is prayer. Submission to Allah through prayer is the primary method of salvation. The muzi or the caller calls people to pray five times per day facing uh, Mecca, no matter where you live, uh, you bring your prayer mat and at certain times of the day, you, you kneel and you, you pray to Mecca. And a lot of praying is not, uh, dear Allah, thank you so, what a great day it was today, Lord. And this is not the prayer that is made. Uh, much of the prayer that is made is, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. You know, this, this is the repetitive uh, prayer. Fasting is the fourth one, especially during the month of Ramadan, which is the holy month. And this is done to commemorate uh, or as a commemoration of the things that happened in Muhammad's life and also as a sign of submission. And then the fifth thing is the pilgrimage. In other words, making a trip to Mecca or sending a representative once in a lifetime to participate in worship there. The highest title worn by a Muslim uh, is Hajj, which means pilgrim. Uh, their concept of heaven and what it is uh, and what it means to be saved, uh, if you're just examining it objectively, is very earthy. It's very earthly. Uh, there's food, there's fellowship, there's comfort, there's sensual, even sexual uh, pleasure. It's like going back to the garden. You know, it's heaven on earth, so to speak, this paradise that they talk about. And we've heard a lot about you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, suicide bombers you know, are promised 
uh, what is it, 72 virgins uh, to attend to attend to them, you know. And so that promise, you know, uh, is a very earthly thing. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, fleshly uh, type of, uh, of uh, reward. Note that the, and by the way, by the way, uh, dying as a martyr is the only guaranteed way to get to paradise. You, you could live the best life, you could do the five pillars, you could do all of that and not make it. Why? Well, Allah just said no. So you have some unemployed 23 year old who doesn't have a girlfriend, no prospects, no future, no nothing. And you tell him, strap this thing to yourself. It'll be over in a moment. You won't feel a thing. And the next thing that you know, 72 virgins. It's a guarantee. It's a lock. It's a promise. So that's very, a powerful motivation for some individuals in that part of the world. Um, note that the process of salvation is strictly a works oriented system aimed at a fickle God with a reward that is like the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Uh, uh, holy war or the infata is a war uh, declared to protect uh, 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 a danger to Islam. And it's believed that during such a war, if one dies, as I say, heaven is uh, guaranteed. A lot of holy wars, however, have nothing to do with defending religion of Islam, but rather a justification for conflict that we know of. You notice uh, today's political situation, many uh, Islamic countries or several Islamic countries have made peace with Israel, even peace treaties acknowledging their right to exist and so on and so forth. Well, that has nothing to do with religion. That has to do with oil. <laughs> now that America doesn't need Middle Eastern oil, there's no leverage anymore to keep the battle going and to keep the riots going. You know? So all of a sudden, uh, you know, the countries make peace so that they can trade with each other, so that they can help each other economically. I, I'm not being cynical, I'm just saying this is, this is how it works. You know, it has nothing to, these wars have nothing to do with religion. Uh, they do when, they do, however, when one Islamic country is fighting against another Islamic country. Again, that's usually to, you know, to who's going to dominate religiously, whose leader is the legitimate inheritor of Muhammad's role. Uh, they'll go to war for that against one another, okay? Uh, the cultists, the cultists, the cultists, uh, well, there's the five pillars of faith and that's, you know, their kind of religion revolves around that. Um, they have uh, collective prayers in mosques. Uh, there is no collective weekly service, but rather an integrated lifestyle where the believers, they gather for prayer at the mosque, uh, but the majority of the religion is worked out in one's life. Uh, the Quran is their scripture. Uh, by the way, a, a, a very tightly knit cultural group, by the way, I, I have a friend that worked in Saudi Arabia for years and said, I mean, they are uh, here, a uh, conversion to Christianity. You have one individual happens to strike up a conversation with another individual. They start talking about church things and would you like to have a Bible study? And you know, you, you study and you know. But there he says, it doesn't work like that. He said, everybody's working on you all the time to try to get you to convert to Islam. You go for a haircut, the barber's talking to you about it. You go to the store to buy a pair of shoes, the salesman is talking to you about it. No matter where you go, if you're a foreigner, if, you, if you're, if you're a, a Christian, you know, if you're not a, a Muslim, he says they, uh, they, it's like a team sport, if you wish. Uh, so I admire that idea. I, I admire the idea so that, that, that as a group, you know, they're, they're convinced about their faith and together they try to win, uh, you know, converts. Uh, I think that's a very positive thing. Anyways, there's scriptures, the Quran, what Muhammad presented is believed uh, to uh, be totally the work of God. Even the writing, even the pages 
It's the final word of God to man. The Arabic language used to write the book is also holy. So the language is holy, the paper is holy, the book is holy, the ideas are holy. Um, the present copy uh, was assembled in 650 AD uh, in that era. And all translations come from this one book. Uh, it's comprised of 114 surahs uh, or chapters, if you wish. Uh, it governs daily life, uh, local law and worship. I'll read you a, a small sample. Uh, this is uh, some guidance for pilgrims uh, 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 who are doing the five pillars of faith. And so, uh, not, you know, the Quran here, section 181, it says, as to the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was sent down to be man's guidance and an explanation of that guidance and of that illumination, as soon as any one of you observeth the moon, let him set about the fast. But he who is sick or upon a journey shall fast like a like number of other days. God wisheth you ease, but wisheth not your discomfort and that you fulfill the number of days and that you glorify God for his guidance and that you be thankful. And then number 183, again, guidance here for the month of Ramadan, it says, you are allowed on the night of the fast to approach your wives. They are your garment and ye are their garment. God knoweth that ye defraud yourselves therein. So he turneth unto you and forgiveth you. Now therefore go in unto them with full desire for that which God hath ordained for you and eat and drink until you can discern a white thread from a black thread by daybreak. Then fast strictly till night and go not into them, unto them, but rather pass the time in the mosques. These are the bounds set up by God. Therefore come not near them. Thus God maketh his signs clear to men that they may fear him. So there's some advice for a, for a pilgrim and some of his, his activity during his, uh, during his time of, uh, of uh, fasting. Uh, they believe that the Bible does come from God, uh, but it has been corrupted by man. And so uh, God then gave man the Quran as the final you know, word from him because of its, uh, and it's pure. The geography, uh, of course, uh, the Middle East, Africa, Pakistan, uh, now of course, all over the world. And then just a couple of miscellaneous things. A lot of uh, beliefs of angels uh, um, and demons uh, that are elaborate, stemming from previous religious influence. Like I say, they borrow from Judaism. They not only borrow from Judaism, like uh, Judaism from the Old Testament, but also they borrow from Jewish myths and Jewish histories you know, that are not even included in the Bible, it's, it's, it's a synergistic, it's a synergistic religion that's taken you know, from all over and kind of uh, brought together. Even the mistakes of other, of other groups are kind of incorporated uh, in there. Uh, the big problem, however, is that the religion cannot accommodate technical or social progress very easily. Uh, for example, you know, changes in the role for women and advance in technology of communication uh, does not uh, go well with, uh, with uh, Islam. Uh, the Quran, for example, does not hold up well under critical examination like the Bible. As a matter of fact, you're not allowed to criticize. And I don't mean criticize by saying bad things, I mean, to examine the Quran carefully and to examine it, you know, comparing it to history or comparing it to proper theology or proper thinking or just common sense and logic or history or accuracy of its dates or stuff like that. You know, how many people have examined the Bible for 2000 years nonstop and continue to do so today and yet it continues to, you know, to, to be authentic. It continues to have power to convert souls and so on and so forth. Well, you're not allowed to do that to the Quran. You know, under the, the threat of death, you, you, can't, you can't criticize, you can negatively criticize the Quran. And so of course, uh, this is a way of protecting 
this static sense. Nothing changes. We, we, we don't accept any criticism, so then for sure nothing's going to change. Okay? All right, so that's, uh, that's about uh, enough for uh, uh, Islam. Uh, next uh, week, uh, we're going to do uh, Hinduism, which is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating uh, religion. The oldest, uh, it's actually the oldest organized religion in the world. Uh, again, I encourage you to download those, um, those lesson notes ahead of time, and uh, I think you'll have a better time following along with the lessons. Well, thank you very much for your attention at home.